Okay, so hello everyone. So welcome to attend our this week Rutgers Infusion AI seminar talk. And today we're glad to have Professor Xuan Zhang from the Washington University in St. Louis to give us this talk. And here's the brief uh, bio introduction of Professor Zhang. She is currently an associate professor in the Department of the Electrical and the System Engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. She received her bachelor degree from the Tsinghua University and the master and PhD degree from the Cornell University. She, uh, Professor Zhang works across the fields of the VSI design, computer architecture, and the cyber physics systems. And her research interests include the hardware software co-design for efficient machine learning and artificial intelligence, adaptive power and resource management for autonomous systems, and hardware security primitives in analog and the mixed signal domain. Professor Zhang is the uh, recipient of the NSF Career Award, Asian Host Best Paper Award, Data Based pa uh, Best Paper Award, and ISLPD Design Context Award. And uh, her work has also been nominated for the Best Paper Awards at ASP DAC, Date, and uh, Date and the DAC. So now let's welcome Professor Zhang to give us this talk, exploring autonomous edge intelligence in analog domain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Yuan. Uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, um, uh, to share my research. Um, so uh, today um, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, how we investigated uh, uh, the different approaches uh, to explore autonomous edge intelligence in the analog domain. Uh, so I'll get started. Um, so I'd like to describe the current uh, state of technology as the tale of two intelligence. Um, because on one hand, uh, thanks to recent rapid advancement of AI and machine learning, uh, machine intelligence no now enjoy uh, abilities in a, a number of domains such as perception, decision-making and planning, understanding and knowledge discovery that not only rival humans, but sometimes even excel human level. Um, on the other hand, the kind of general intelligence as in, sometimes envisioned in this you know, cute uh, science fiction uh, figures remain quite evasive and unattainable. Uh, not to mention that when we examine closely under the hood, we'll find that current narrow AI technology suffers from poor computational efficiency and relies heavily on um, uh, cloud computing facility. So from energy and resource efficiency perspective, um, it still severe, uh, severely underperform our brain by orders of magnitude. Um, one key word in my title, which um, I want to emphasize is autonomy. So it is a concept that is closely related to intelligence. So um, arguably intelligence emerged over millions of years as a biological system evolved to adapt to its environment. Therefore, to demonstrate autonomy at the edge, the system should be able to handle interactions between the physical and the cyber worlds in a closed uh, close loop manner. So using the self-driving car as an example, it possesses uh, a number of sensing modality and um, uh, enormous onboard processing power to achieve a level of autonomy uh, that resembles the human driver. Um, so therefore, what distinguish uh, such autonomous system uh, from many of today's AI powered application and services on the internet um, is that they are severely constrained by um, physical resources and form factor. Um, so, and as you can imagine, um, as these uh, physical platforms shrink from cars to drones or even uh, extremely to insect sized uh, micro robots, uh, autonomous edge intelligence face many pressing challenges. So in my talk today, I will focus on techniques we develop to address uh, mainly the key performance and efficiency issues. Uh, but in the end, I will touch upon other topics like security and safety, which are also part of my research uh, portfolio. Um, to begin with, uh, why we are interested in exploring techniques in the analog domain in the first place. 
Um, I think the reason um, importantly is because we are increasingly in a moment of uh, re, uh, reckoning as the classic computing paradigm approach its limit. And we no longer can depend on the old tricks uh, such as uh, Moore's law and Dinard's uh, scaling to keep uh, improving uh, the energy efficiency like almost effortlessly in the past. So as we face the end of the traditional technology scaling, further improvement of efficiency has to come from some other novel approaches that deviates from the conventional digital processing. Um, so there are also going to be methods that embrace joint optimization of algorithm and uh, hardware. And both are the element uh, used in my, in my research. Uh, by the way, I, I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, please feel to interrupt me uh, if you have questions uh, at any point. So aside from uh, enabling killer um, autonomous application at the edge, improving uh, computing uh, performance and efficiency is also uh, imperative against the broader backdrop of technology revolution. Um, we are increasingly experiencing the relentless pace of data explosion, not only from people interacting with uh, the internet services uh, every minute of every day, but also from billions of connected smart devices deployed uh, by uh, IoT applications. Um, so in this pursuit of the next generation computing system um, that are much more efficient and much more performant, um, uh, nature provides us with a perfect model, the brain. Therefore, throughout history, researchers have always been fascinated by the brain and inspired to build artificial system that mimic its information processing power. So in fact, today's popular uh, deep learning method uh, models, uh, such as the neural network originate from people's attempt to emulate the structure and working principle of the, um, the biological brain back in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and another notable thread of research came from exploring uh, brains uh, analog style of computing with electronic circuits. Um, so recently, the introduction of emerging non-volatile devices and large-scale neuromorphic uh, chips uh, systems provide a new opportunity for brain-inspired systems. So uh, I'd like to put my research as um, kind of follows these legacies and inspiration from uh, uh, these past uh, pr prior research. Um, but my research expands the analog and mixed signal methodology with a unique focus on system co-optimization and streamlined um, design flow. So uh, one huge advantage of analog and mixed signal, uh, uh, so uh, I usually refer this as AMS um, uh, approach is its energy efficiency. And it comes from the fact that it leverage the intrinsic uh, physical property of the circuit and device to perform computations such as uh, addition, multiply, or nonlinear saturation. Um, so later in my talk, I will provide examples of how they are used to gain efficiency. Um, so another unique uh, perspective of my research is to um, take a principled and quantitative approach. So in this way, we'll not be dealing with like ad hoc techniques, but rather we can develop an integrated practical design flow that uh, can be easily automated and scaled with technology, which um, is not being uh, much done in the past. So again, you will see examples uh, of this uh, principle, uh, how this principle guide uh, my work later in the talk. So my agenda today is to give you a concrete example of how we tackle design um, challenges of autonomous edge intelligence using analog domain processing. Uh, in particular, I will introduce a design framework called uh, New ADC. Uh, it is um, a uh, way to reimagine the analog to digital interface through a learnable analog to information conversion. Um, I will then briefly talk about how we extend the new ADC methodology to address a few practical issues. And in the end, I will conclude with my uh, broad research agenda and vision. So let's get started with the analog to digital interface. 
you may ask why we want to reinvent the wheel when we already have ADCs that seems to work well and how it relates to edge intelligence. Um, so first of all, uh, the A2D interface are ubiquitous and indispensable in edge systems, especially when um, considering that edge system often requires um, and incorporates uh, sensors and actuator components to interact with the physical world. Uh, because although information is increasingly processed in the digital domain, uh, it invariably has to cross the analog to digital boundary, given that all signal in nature is analog. Uh, moreover, ADC is perhaps uh, one of the most classic and quintessential um, AMS circuits. So if we can uh, come up with a design solution for ADCs, then uh, it could have much broader applicability to other AMS circuits. Um, so despite uh, it's being like very essential and classic uh, circuit, ADC still face uh, many challenges. Um, and you can see that current design um, method often lacks flexibility and uh, automation. Um, it cannot easily support uh, the different kind of uh, quantization schemes, and uh, it relies on manual design process that's quite uh, time and labor, labor consuming. So um, how do we bring innovation in this well-studied field? Um, just for those of you who may not be very familiar with ADC, uh, so let me give you a refresher. The essential function um, ADC or uh, analog to digital converter uh, performs is to convert analog signal, which is things like analog voltages to digital bits. Uh, so therefore it can be seen as uh, discretizing in both time and amplitude. Uh, the, in an ideal ADC, the um, the former is achieved by sampling and the latter by quantization. So specifically, you can see the ideal quantization um, and ideal ADC uh, performs is uh, this kind of uh, uniform staircase function that maps the input voltages to uh, its corresponding digital work. Um, so traditionally, to arrive at the ideal quantization function, um, the classic uh, ADC architecture, um, here I'm showing a, uh, an architecture called flash ADC. So it takes the input uh, through an array, or you can also think of this as a layer of comparators with reference voltages that uh, uh, set at the uniform staircase threshold then the output becomes the thermometer code, and then you can uh, decode that to standard binary uh, code word. So here is the leap of uh, thought that spark our re research idea. So the structure of the flash ADC looks similar to a three layer neural network with the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. Um, and moreover, uh, in addition to the structural analogy, it is also possible to achieve functional uh, approximation um, because the universal approximation theorem state that a multi-layer uh, perceptron or you know, this kind of uh, uh, two layer, a three layer uh, neural network can approximate arbitrary nonlinear function. So, why not approximate an ideal quantization function in this case? So this is the major intuition that brought over uh, new ADC work. To uh, essentially to approximate the flash ADC, uh, both structurally and functionally with a multi-layer perceptron. So, uh, let me give you an overview of, of methodology and framework uh, before uh, getting so, to some uh, uh, detailed uh, technique and results. So our goal is to map the ADC design problem into a neural network approximation problem. And the key is that the neural network is not just an abstract math model, but what we need is a hardware neural network that compute with actual analog signals, uh, such as voltages and currents. And to build this hardware neural network, we choose RM crossbar and 
uh, CMOS inverters um, as the hardware substrate. Um, and later we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how they can perform the general neural network operation, namely the vector matrix, uh, matrix uh, multiplication and the uh, activation function. So here you can think like in this case, we take the continuous voltage as the input to this hardware neural network. And at the output, it converted these to discrete voltage levels that indicate the digital code word. And that's how this um, whole uh, hardware design works. So once we have chosen the hardware substrate, uh, we now must solve the training problem. So um, uh, what we would like to do with the, the neural network to approximate is the ideal quantization function. So we can create the ground truth using the ideal linear quantization function and learn the weight through back propagation. Um, and finally, after learning uh, the learning converges, we can translate the weight we have learned and then um, to uh, instantiate the uh, weight onto the uh, RM uh, and program the RM conductance and the resistance value. So this completes the whole methodology. So what makes our new ADC framework especially powerful is the fact that with the same hardware substrate, we can, it can be trained to approximate any quantization function, such as log or square root, and it's not at all limited to one fixed function, because all you have to do is to train a different set of weight and reprogram the RM. Uh, any question here? Um, okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, uh, introduce sure. more of the details. Um, Hello, Shen. Yes. Yeah, I have actually I have one question here. When you mentioned about the synthesizable ADC, so what does the synthesizable mean? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I have some slides later which go through the entire uh, design automation uh, flow. But uh, basically, synthesizable means um, uh, traditionally uh, when you design an ADC, um, you actually need manual design, right? So here, because we rely on this general framework and with this uh, hardware substrate, so we can actually, you know, just run a script and this script will eventually generate the entire net list of the, the design. So uh, it basically automate the um, topology synthesis of the the ADC uh, circuit. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, uh, you can see that we use RM technology as a perfect test bed to demonstrate the, uh, the fact that our method, method is compatible with technology scaling and can very easily be poured over different uh, um, process and technology. So RM de device has uh, you know, a lot of advantages. Uh, it's small size, very excellent uh, scalability, very fast switching speed and uh, good endurance. So without going into the device details, um, so uh, you can think of the RM uh, device as um, a programmable resistor, okay? So once programmed, uh, its resistance can be read by applying voltage across uh, the device. So this in turn would generate a current and in this way, simply by the device following Ohm's law, it performs a form of uh, multiply. Um, so, and when we organize a bunch of these RM devices into a crossbar array, um, you can see that uh, at each of this column, the current of each of the RM device would combine and as dictated by the Kirchhoff's law. So uh, this would, this uh, RM crossbar essentially in effect, allow us to perform uh, vector matrix uh, multiplication or VMM um, for short in the analog domain. So we know that VMM is uh, the important operator in a general neural network. And therefore it is the key ingredients we're looking for in the hardware substrate. And that's the reason we choose RM crossbar as uh, the, the hardware substrate in our design. Um, we, we so um, in reality, uh, this is uh, still somewhat simplified. A single crossbar does not work because we uh, must consider the fact that 
the actual neural network weights can contain negative values and cannot be directly mapped as a uh, RM con uh, conductance because conductance has to be positive. Um, instead, we can use a uh, what we call the dual path array structure. So you can see there's a upper and a lower um, path. Um, uh, and then in this way, um, we can convert the weight into the difference between the two um, conductance. And therefore, you can have both a positive value and negative value. Um, so this then would complete the general uh, VMM operation. So the activation function in our case is uh, the other operator we also needed. And uh, we can approximate it in hardware using the uh, CMOS inverter. So here you can see we use the um, uh, voltage uh, transfer characteristic of VTC um, function of the inverter to represent the um, nonlinear activation function. Because as it turns out that uh, the exact value of the activation function does not matter as long as it has the right S shape with saturation. And um, we can, in the uh, analog domain, we can approximate that with a simply an inverter VTC. Um, so as explained earlier, uh, through the trick of the dual pass configuration uh, with complementary input, we can overcome the weight uh, limitation and be able to instantiate a general neural network layer. Um, and then uh, since we in fact need a MLP, uh, which has multiple layers, um, we cascade these blocks and include uh, both a positive path and a negative path in the first layer. Um, so. Uh, you can see the positive path and the negative path. And then each of the paths, it, uh, it has this uh, uh, dual array configuration. Um, so uh, this would provide the complementary input we need for the output layer, uh, meaning we have a positive voltage input and a negative voltage input. Uh, so, um, so, so far we have described the um, uh, new ADC design in the compute mode uh, when the RM crossbar act as the analog domain VMM or um, vector matrix multiply, uh, multiplication unit. So the system can also support the um, program mode. Uh, that's when you program the specific conductance value to the RM. So finally, unlike, uh, so that's the question uh, which Professor Yuan uh, asked earlier. Uh, so unlike many previous analog computing work that use analog circuits such as operational amplifier and uh, integrators, um, our design only employ a digital style circuit like the inverters. Um, therefore, uh, we can make this whole thing uh, synthesizable. Um, uh, because it doesn't rely on the analog style design, which uh, require a lot of parameter uh, tuning, um, kind of manual parameter tuning. Um, so far, I've provided you with the conceptual description of the design, um, and hopefully that gives you some intuition of how this whole thing works. To rigorously formulate the learning problem, uh, we lay out the mathematical expression in, in our paper to model the circuit behavior. Uh, we choose the widely accepted cross-entropy loss function as our learning objective and incorporate the constraints uh, in the uh, training. So, the constraints, for example, uh, one unique uh, aspect is um, recall that the weights are expressed as conductance um, and the uh, bias are actually voltage levels. Therefore, these values all have certain uh, constraints for its parameter uh, range. Um, so our training method takes all these into consideration. Um, so uh, you can find more details of our training method uh, in the paper, but there's one particular interesting observation I'd like to point out. Um, that um, is this dramatic effect that we find about the uh, encoding method. So it turns out that the quality of this um, uh, and uh, neural network approximation actually depends critically on how we encode the digital output. Um, so what do, what do I mean by that? So we start actually with the naive standard binary encoding um, and then find that in this case, even with a large number of hidden neurons, the neural network still cannot approximate well. 
And you can see this is evident by these like glitches on these uh, reconstructed um, uh, sine wave. So the reason is because the bits in the uh, binary codes require frequent sign change, especially the LSD. So this makes the approximation uh, very difficult and translates to higher complexity. So we solve this by proposing overall encoding, which we call the smooth code. Uh, so this is similar to kind of a gray code, um, uh, but um, the, which uh, basically uh, we try to minimize the bit transition uh, between the code word. And this works uh, amazingly well, and you can see this uh, significantly improves the reconstructed uh, signal quality, even at much fewer number of uh, hidden neurons. Um, another uh, notable contribution of our work is that it allows for the fully um, automated design flow. So design automation of uh, ADCs has previously been a huge challenge and remains an open research que uh, question. Yet in our new ADC framework, it can be automated following three phases. So we start with characterizing the, um, the uh, behavior of the RM and CMOS building blocks. Um, and then uh, in the offline training phase, we learn the weights um, uh, to program the RM array um, for the neural network model to approximate the desirable quantization function. And then we can synthesize the hardware and verify its performance in uh, SPI simulator. So all of these is automated, which means you only need to run the script or like click a button, and then it generates the ADC uh, uh, design for you. Um, so this is uh, in contrast to a previous uh, kind of manually designed um, process. Um, we have thoroughly evaluated the performance of our, of our new ADC with different metrics. Um, so on this left figure, you can see that the reconstructed signal from um, the new ADC can perfectly approximate the different uh, quantization function, be it linear, uh, log, or um, square root. Uh, and another well-established uh, measure of ADC performance is, is ENOB. Um, so it stands for effective number of bits. Again, the table shows that we can achieve the ideal ENOB that is close to uh, um, the intended ADC resolution. Um, <clears throat> Um, and, and finally, um, despite being fully automatically synthesized, our um, new ADC compares favorably with the state-of-the-art ADC design in the literature. Um, so you can see a number of these uh, uh, design specs. Um, and it's not just with the synthesizable design, but uh, when it, uh, we also compared it with traditional flash ADC. Um, designed by human experts. And you can see that uh, the, um, all of these uh, performance uh, metric um, uh, we compare very favor favorably with. Um, so what have we learned so far? I uh, just want to give you some takeaways. Um, so uh, the main contribution um, is we have shown you that an analog mixed signal domain neural approximation strategy can transform a design problem into a learning problem. And it brings a number of desirable properties. Um, uh, I think there's also interesting um, in the kind of observation we stumbled that uh, the encoding actually play an important role. Uh, however, um, there's still some practical consideration remains. Um, so, uh, we show this uh, a um, uh, very interesting method, but can it actually be implemented in real hardware? Um, what are the non uh, idealities uh, has been considered and can it yield meaningful uh, system benefits? So that kind of bring me to the next part of my talk um, where I like to show you how we address these practical considerations uh, uh, by extending of a methodology. Um, so in the interest of time, um, so I think I will kind of not go into the technical details, but instead give you a high level sketch of our strategy. And you're welcome to check out our paper or, you know, um, uh, communicate with me uh, offline. 
uh, for the details. Um, so the first problem when it comes to analog domain is robustness, because we know that real hardware suffers from fabrication precision, design uh, process corners, uh, and a lot of um, other effects. Uh, so analog domain operation are especially susceptible. So to address this, we employed um, what we call um, variation aware retraining. Um, so um, that's uh, uh, by explicitly incorporating these nonlinear effects in the training process. So the result is uh, much improved. Uh, you can uh, see the difference here and then the histogram here. Uh, uh, robustness against the PVT variation and de uh, device offsets. Um, so um, another robustness uh, issue comes from the fact that uh, we use RM device, uh, but RM device practically uh, only has um, certain limited precision. So that's usually in the neighborhood of uh, two to four bits. So um, it means that if we, uh, the uh, initial method we have introduced, um, it can only um, uh, support modest resolution um, for ADC. So to achieve higher resolution, we employ the pipeline architecture um, that compose uh, a high resolution ADC by cascading multiple row low resolution stages. So it is a strategy that has been uh, deployed uh, in traditional ADC, and we show that it also works quite well in neural approximated ADC. So uh, the, the way it works in this example, you can see that each stage, in fact, it just resolves uh, one bit, and then it subtract the um, residue, scale it up, and then pass it down to the next stage. So in this way, the higher resolution can be derived from low precision circuits. Um, the next question um, is whether we can apply this method um, beyond just analog to digital conversion. So in other words, uh, the input output mapping can, can be more diverse uh, and, and it's not just uh, an analog input map to digital output uh, as in the case of the ADCs. So indeed, we find that the, um, it, there can be a, uh, this kind of neural approximation method can be made more general uh, to enable design automation of uh, kind of arbitrary analog and mixed signal uh, domain circuits, uh, where the input can be both analog and, and uh, uh, both analog and digital, and you can have like a um, different number of channels, and then output can also be uh, uh, in the form of analog or digital values. Um, so in particular, in you know, our earlier example of a pipeline architecture for uh, high resolution ADC, uh, we need uh, two sub blocks, a sub ADC and a residue circuit. And unlike the uh, sub ADC, the residue circuit is in fact a, a, a circuit block that takes both analog input and uh, digital input and has to um, uh, uh, generate analog output. And then we can apply the uh, uh, generalized neural approximation uh, methodology in this case. Um, uh, so uh, we find that we can successfully approximate the, both the sub blocks um, in each stage with two MLP separately. So one for the sub ADC and the other for the residue circuits. Uh, so it shows that we can generalize our methods. Um, and finally, um, you may also wonder um, if our neural approximation methods for AMS circuits can in fact translate to meaningful compute performance, uh, uh, computing performance and efficiency improvement. Because I, at the very beginning, I mentioned that we want to address um, the um, uh, performance and efficiency problem in edge autonomous systems. So um, uh, to look into this potential, we investigate the, ap the application of our method in the uh, processing in memory accelerators, or PIM for short. Um, so uh, in fact, you already see this 
um, figure earlier, right? So what this shows is that um, uh, the RM crossbar mac uh, uh, macro is um, uh, it's a good way uh, shows um, uh, that you can perform the um, vector matrix multiplication in the analog domain. And because of this property, it is also used extensively in RM-based uh, PIM accelerator to uh, speed up uh, the operation, um, the VMM operation in deep learning models, and uh, in this, this way, uh, kind of accelerate uh, the machine learning um, uh, algorithm. So uh, it, <clears throat> um, but it turns out that this type of RM based PIM suffers severe performance bottleneck due to its peripheral circuits. Um, so why is that? Um, you, even though you can perform VMM very efficiently uh, in the analog domain using the RM crossbar, you still need to pass its input as, uh, and get its output as digital bits. And uh, in, this, in this case, um, you, can, you can see that it requires a frequent uh, analog to digital conversion to stream in and out these digital bits. And these actually, the, the uh, peripheral circuit now becomes the bottleneck that limit the performance of the RM-based uh, PIM accelerator. Um, so um, you can see that uh, uh, in this case, these per peripheral circuits account for the majority of the uh, energy and area of the system and limit its throughput uh, because of the uh, frequent uh, analog to digital conversion. Uh, uh, because the in a in a conventional way um, of performing these um, um, acceleration, uh, the uh, you have to digitize the. Um, uh, the, the current and convert that to voltage and you have to digitize that value at every bit line. So therefore uh, you need uh, quite significant resources uh, for these ADCs. Uh, and then once you digitize this value, you, you do shift and add and uh, uh, in the digital domain. Um, so uh, it, um, so with over method, um, the neural approximation method, um, it turns out that we can extend this analog uh, signal flow across multiple um, bit line and time cycle by exchanging the order of the digitization and shift and um, add. So this way we can speed up the, um, uh, the uh, throughput of the PIM operation. So, um, uh, so basically, uh, again, just to give you like a high level intuition. So in a traditional way, you have to digitize at every um, bit, bit line, but in our method, because we can approximate the uh, shift and add function in the analog domain, therefore there's no longer any need to digitize at the uh, each bit line, but instead you can perform the neural approximated shift, uh, shift and add operation, and then accumulate only one single final result and then do these uh, analog to digital conversion. And that's the key uh, of our method to reduce, significantly really reduce the number of um, uh, ADC conversion and then translate to uh, better um, energy and throughput uh, performance. So you can see in these um, uh, results where we compare um, the over <clears throat> uh, energy efficiency and throughput uh, with the best performing state of the art RM uh, based uh, PIM accelerators. Um, and then we get significant improvement uh, in both uh, energy efficiency and throughput. Um, and then I want to emphasize, um, we can prove that uh, uh, our method basically gives you the minim minimal amount of uh, uh, analog to digital conversion in uh, across the uh, different strategies. Um, to summarize, uh, we not only propose a novel approach, uh, but we also extend this novel approach uh, to improve its robustness, um, demonstrate that it can be generalizable, 
um, and showcase its potential in achieving uh, superior efficiency at the system level. Um, so uh, I've dedicated the majority of the talk to discuss analog domain processing for edge intelligence. Um, but my uh, the, the kind of research in my lab covers more broadly in the area that uh, looks uh, at other aspects um, at the edge. Uh, so um, I, I, I just want to kind of summarize uh, the research activities in my lab um, so you get a full picture. Um, so um, I like to think of the research in my lab uh, under these three pillars that spans uh, design automation, computer architecture and system code design. And this pillar are cross-cutting with um, uh, research themes, uh, different research themes. And in this talk, uh, so I've um, uh, focused on the information processing theme and uh, shows that the introduction of analog domain method can greatly enrich this solution space. Um, so similarly, we find that analog domain element uh, and cross-layer optimization also opens new dimension in the area of security and resource management. Uh, so in security, um, my lab has investigated uh, kind of a number of approaches uh, uh, related to model-driven um, analog children detection and benchmarking, uh, uh, leveraging analog property to uh, design lightweight security primitive, and also look at the um, physically realizable adversary for autonomous systems such as like self-driving um, cars. Um, and uh, in resource management, um, we also have a number of work on uh, kind of um, uh, co-design of uh, power delivery system, uh, learning-based uh, uh, management uh, and uh, real-time scheduling, uh, and then evaluating real-time um, uh, performance of, uh, at the mission level. So uh, due to the time limit, I cannot talk uh, about all these work, but um, I will be happy to discuss uh, offline if you are interested and feel free to reach out. Um, so uh, finally, uh, I just want to say that none of the work I presented today would be possible without uh, these amazing people uh, that I work with and their support uh, and efforts. Uh, and also I'm lucky to be funded by a number of uh, funding agencies. Um, so um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. I can you know, go back to the, some of the previous slides if you have. Uh, uh, have questions, yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Zhang, for this very excellent talk. And uh, any questions from the audience? So you can unmute yourself and uh, ask questions. Or you can also input your question in the chat box if you want. Uh, so, so actually, Professor John, I have one question uh, for the eight, uh, for the pin part. Mm -hmm. So, as you mentioned that, so the, we know that ADC and DC conversion that is kind of right now bottleneck for the pin accelerator, and uh, so it's very interesting. So, you are uh, the major part of the talk is about uh, how to optimize the ADC. And uh, so we can use kind of such the neural inspired ADC to do that. And so I was wondering, so since right now we can approximate the exact ADC function with the neural work. Mm -hmm. And also we know that, so the PIM is largely used for to accelerate the neural work. So actually here, actually we, there exist two neural there. So whether there's some the design space, space configurations that actually we can like to perform kind of the model and the hardware co-design to fine tune these two networks together or to just use a kind of a one neural model. And yeah, the, yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, my um, uh, over experience on this, on this uh, problem is um, you can see that uh, there are still the different level of abstraction. So uh, the, um, you know, we've, we've shown uh, design methodology for optimizing uh, ADC, right? 
But when you look at the PIM uh, accelerator as a whole system, there's actually uh, non-trivial uh, things uh, such as like uh, data flow and uh, the uh, things kind of at the, the, the interaction between at the block level. Therefore, it's not just a matter of uh, kind of I have the, um, uh, so if you don't uh, innovate or um, uh, kind of optimize the data flow, then just simply optimize at the block level. Let, let's say, you know, the uh, 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 RDM crossbar where I map the, um, uh, the uh, uh, neural network model versus how I approximate the ADC uh, and then set that abstraction level at, at uh, uh, fixed, it, it, it doesn't work very well. So you actually need to think about um, uh, kind of uh, uh, in our case, like exchange the order of some, uh, some blocks and therefore uh, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, uh, cross-layer uh, code design, but not just uh, optimizing uh, the um, at each of the uh, block level. Uh, even uh, like you suggested, uh, even if uh, uh, it's um, by uh, kind of uh, uh, incorporating the interaction between the neural network model and uh, the uh, ADC, it's still not sufficient. Okay, okay. Yeah. And also, I have some follow-up question if the, the audience right now, they don't ask questions. So uh, I also have some questions about it at device level. So here, so first, uh, your ADC, right now, your target to improve uh, the classical flash ADC. So how about some other type of it? Think about Delta and uh... yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great question. So, uh, the the work uh, that shows the pipeline architecture is actually uh, this one, which we uh, essentially showed. Uh, uh, you know, in addition to the flash ADC, we also can uh, approximate the pipeline ADC by um, kind of um, transforming that architecture here too. Uh, so. Uh, we uh, we have some um, uh, kind of continued uh, work or uh, you know thoughts in this area, which also could apply to uh, the the uh, SAR ADC, which is uh, kind of um, the uh, successive approximation based uh, ADC. So there there are these like parallels uh, between the different architecture and the different. Um, neural network approximation model. Um, uh, so, so yes, uh, that's, that's something in, in, uh, we have considered too, um, uh, uh, just, you know, still uh, some remaining work. Yeah, because I think that since we have the, like a different type of neural model available and we have also different type of target ADCs. Actually, there's, there exists a, a huge space for design exploration for the automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if you have any uh, thoughts, we would love to like uh, talk about and collaborate on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, uh, yeah and uh, also I have questions. So right now, so in your neural ADC, so you use the, the CMOS plus the RM, so. Mm -hmm. Elaborate the more why you choose the RM instead of other emerging techniques here. Um, so uh, I think the RM, our choice of the RM, it um, so um, our methodology is not limited to use RM. Uh, uh, so uh, I show that uh, we basically need some hardware. Uh, substrate that's able to perform this kind of uh, VMM operation, right? So RM is uh, kind of a, uh, I would say a convenient choice uh, uh, because it has been well studied and uh, uh, has, has been shown to uh, be able to um, uh, realize that that uh, function. Uh, but um, there could also be other uh, uh, kind of uh, device that uh, uh, we can support. So the key is to extract the uh, uh, the device behavior uh, and then be able to kind of uh, make sure we can map the operation and also uh, 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 incorporate the uh, some of the non nonlinearities uh, uh, and uh, uh, non idealities of the device and into our training framework. So um, the the goal is actually 
uh, to show this more like a like a methodology that's not uh, completely rely on one or the other uh, the process or, or technology, but uh, it can be used as a general framework. Um, yeah, so it could be other uh, non-volatile devices, or we have um, some um, kind of C, you know, uh, CMOS-based uh, uh, VMM uh, um, uh, uh, circuit macro as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so that is my next question. So, mm -hmm. whether like we because right now like the, the in SRAM computing they're already kind of the the received many attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whether, because when you integrate the CMOS and RM, two different techniques together, maybe you have some the fabrication problem. Mm -hmm. So whether just to use the, the SRAM and the in SRAM computing integrate your neural ADC. So it kind oh, of- Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, so I think um, uh, we, uh, we should be able to uh, leverage that. Um, in fact, we had some earlier uh, results showing that that is possible. Uh, with uh, the, the, I, I think the challenge uh, with uh, in SRAM kind of uh, computing is, um, so because you are using uh, like just CMOS devices, um, uh, so I think it's, uh, it's uh, even um, more important to see how uh, you can realize this like multi-bit resolution and then be able to support. Uh, and then uh, also, you know, you, you can show that this neural approximated AD ADC with purely the C CMOS devices can outperform the traditional ADC uh, performance. Um, I think the functionality, I think we should be able to achieve because we, we have shown that even with like very limited uh, device precision, you can, you can still uh, approximate the um, high resolution uh, ADC function. But um, I think when, when it gets to the, uh, the, uh, the, the performance in terms of uh, power and area uh, using uh, CMOS based uh, uh, devices for the neural approximation, it may get a bit tricky in, in that comparison. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, any questions from the audience? Sorry, I occupied the time for the answer question. Um, excuse me, Professor. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so Professor, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, so uh, I have some questions. I'm sorry um, if I missed some information in your talk. Maybe I asked like the replicate um, questions. So uh, the question is, I want to ask about the uh, scalability of the of of your design. I, I I can see in the previous slide that you are trying to uh, mm -hmm. map in the um, how to say the analog feature, mm -hmm. um, like the the analog uh, loss um, to uh, kind of mapping that into the um, into different, different, um, uh, for example, weights or input data in neural networks. I want to ask, like, um, by uh, by doing this, um, uh, like, what's the what's the general scalability of this design? For example, uh, we have different size of hardware. Uh, I'm sorry, we have different size of um, neural networks with uh, with different numbers of, uh, for example, convolutional layers or different numbers of uh, fully connected layer. So, are you? Are you trying to um, design such a, let's say, a general architecture that can kind of uh, let different types of, uh, different size of neural networks to fit in? Or you are trying to let, uh, let's say, um, for example, uh, like increase or reduce the numbers of a certain, certain parts of your uh, hardware architecture to fitting a certain neural mm -hmm. networks to achieve the um, the best, uh, let's say, the best efficiency. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's a that's a great question. Uh, so let me clarify uh, a couple of things. Uh, so yeah. uh, uh, you, you you mentioned scalability, and from your from your question, I can see that the scalability you refer to is the model, right? So like, can I fit different kind of you yes. know, big neural network model, small neural network model? Yes. So yes. Uh, the the uh, when in, in this uh, new ADC framework, I want to clarify that we, um, 
uh, in this case, we are not trying to fit like, you know, big convolutional neural network model. So we just want to use a kind of simple M MLP model to approximate the quantization function. And yeah. that's why uh, we, in, in terms of that scalability, we don't, we want to optimize such that we can find a, uh, a small enough uh, MLP to well approximate this quantization function. Oh. So we, we don't intend to fit like, you know, large deep or, you know, uh, uh, network. So that's one thing. And in this context, there's also another scalability that I often mention. So this scalability is technology scalability. What I'm trying to mention, uh, um, uh, try to convey is that this method, because we used these like inverter kind of circuits and, uh, you know, uh, RM kind of uh, devices, uh, it can scale to smaller technology. Let's say, you know, even though we designed this with like 130 uh, in, uh, na nanometer. Uh, yes, yes, it But we can very easily kind of scale it yes. to maybe 22 or even like smaller. So that we can do. Okay, um, so yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, keep in mind that in this kind of what we call neural approximated design, we don't intend to use huge network because then uh, it's not uh, com uh, competitive in terms of area and uh, power performance when we compare with the traditional ADC, right? So we, all we want to do is to use a tiny network to be able to approximate the quantization function or whatever like uh, analog mixed signal function. Uh, but uh, I think the, 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 what you mean by like the scalability, it generally applies to the PIM, uh, like RM based PIM design, right? So when you like map these like big network to the, to the RM crossbar. So I think in, in that, that's a separate kind of uh, uh, topic, which uh, uh, has to do with the, those like, um, uh, PIM accelerator design, which I think that that certainly the you can see the RM cross. There's a number of techniques that support that. So those are are uh, scalable. Yeah. I see. I see. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, hello, Professor. I'm Zheng uh, Zhe Wei uh, from NTU uh, Singapore. Uh, so I'm mostly interested in improving the precision of the PIM structure uh, based on RM. Um, but as uh, we can see from your study that uh, mm -hmm. the new, uh, the novel ADC can improve the precision. However, uh, due to the process of the manufacturing of this RM, we are limited by the RM itself. Uh, because it, it doesn't really give us much dynamic range to work with. So how can this work further enhance the precision of existing state-of-the-art RM-based PIM? Oh, um, uh, so I, um, I think you touched upon a slightly different topic. Um, I wouldn't say we have investigate a lot in that. So what I'm trying to show here is um, uh, using like, you know, techniques such as like the pipeline architecture, uh, you can uh, overcome the limited uh, precision of the RM to some extent, right? So it's kind of similar to the fact that uh, even though RM has a uh, limited precision, let's say like two to four bit, but you can use you know, two, uh, two RM or, you know, multiple RM to represent a higher resolution number, right? Because you can kind of uh, decompose that into like multiple RM uh, cells. So, uh, so I, I, I would say, uh, you know, a lot of the technique is at that uh, level and which is kind of similar to the pipeline architecture I'm, I'm showing here. Uh, so, um, you know, that probably can uh, provide you with some inspiration on how this can be applied to the uh, extending the precision in, in the um, PIM, like RM-based PIM uh, design. Uh, but keep in mind, like, uh, I, I, I want to remind you of one thing, right? So, uh, you know, even though uh, in the RM-based PIM, uh, 
you know, we 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 think PIM has limit. Uh, I mean, our RAM de uh, device has limited uh, precision. But uh, uh, in the traditional digital processing, right, uh, one digital bit it can only represent like one one. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, digital storage element can only represent one bit. But it doesn't stop you from you know be able to perform full precision operations using the digital like element, right? Which means that. Uh, if you want to perform like very high precision uh, computation, it is certainly possible. You just need to like design the kind of um, architecture which uh, uh, you know extend that across multiple of the storage like memory storage element. I think that uh, you know that that would be my kind of take on on your question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for your uh, answers. So actually our group uh, previously worked on a full digital, digital based design based on the big serial uh, architecture. So we managed to get pretty close in terms of the density. So uh, the what, what I'm interested in, uh, the reason I'm interested in this kind of, you know, analog based design is because it's, it's really dense. However, if, if we sort of, you know, stack multiple RM together to try to achieve, you know, like higher dynamic range, higher precision, then we are also making a trade-off in terms of this density. And in the end, can it still compete with our existing digital design, which we know can extend to really high precision, like one to 16 bit uh, reconfiguration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one thing I absolutely agree with what you uh, mentioned is the trade-off, right? So I think, um, I don't think like analog domain operation or uh, uh, analog domain approach is superior uh, in all, at all level. I think there's a kind of a sweet spot in terms of precision, uh, you know, accuracy and uh, area and power, which can, it gives analog its uh, kind of bang for its buck, right? Uh, so basically, that, that that's there's a there's a kind of range where analog uh, uh, technique makes sense and can excel or outperform digital. But I don't think that's kind of overall a blank statement um, uh, at, at all. Yeah. So there, in fact, there has been uh, studies uh, from, uh, I think back in early 2000, that looked at kind of this, uh, you know, speed versus uh, signal noise ratio. Uh, and then you can see that uh, there's, uh, when you go to very, very high speed, or when you go to like lower signal noise ratio, that's where uh, analog um, uh, domain approaches uh, uh, can have better performance. But if you go outside that range, digital actually still wins. Yeah. Thanks for your answer. I fully agree with your uh, explanation. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so if no more questions, let, let's thank Professor John again for this very informative and great talk. Also thank everyone to join our today's seminar and uh, see you next week. So Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.